Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Lisa Rashford and I'm CEO of Energize Africa and Apex, which are two positive inv investment platforms um, based in the UK. And um, pleased to have you here today as part of the um, London Climate Action Week. And uh, we're going to be focusing on looking beyond London today um, and how UK investors are accelerating clean renewable energy access in sub-Saharan Africa, um, tackling climate change and transforming lives. And I've got a brilliant um, panel with me here today. Um, and everybody is going to give me a little wave when I um, say their name. So welcome. Uh, Chris Baker-Brown from Bbox, one of the co-founders. Um, next, we have Julian Parrott, who is partner Ethical Futures, one of a, a number of um, financial advisors, uh, and he's based up in Scotland. Um, Rebecca Shirley from Power for All. Welcome, Rebecca. Um, based in Kenya at the moment. And uh, Sneha Shah, General Manager, East Africa, Azuri Technologies. Uh, again, you're based in, you're in Kenya at the moment, I'm assuming, Sneha. Yeah, great. Um, welcome, everyone. Well, it's been um, it's been trying times over the past few months, as we know, with um, with COVID and increased lockdowns um, across a number of countries. Um, but regardless of that, we're still seeing incredible interest in people who want to uh, invest for good with their money. And uh, as you might know, Energize Africa provides an opportunity for people to invest from as little as 50 pounds um, in organizations that are scaling up their pay-as-you-go solar in sub-Saharan Africa and providing families and uh, small and medium-sized enterprises access to energy um, which uh, helps us towards our goals of meeting the uh, sustainable development goals and uh, we're going to talk a bit more in more detail on that and, and hear from um, some of the panellists and hopefully answer some of your questions. Um, <clears throat> just some housekeeping. So we have an hour for the session today. Um, we have a chat function. So if you'd like to um, ask us any questions, please submit your cha uh, chat question through the chat. And uh, I will try and feed those into the conversation as we go, or we'll do some quick fired Q&A at the end. Um, and also just to say this isn't a financial promotion in any way and we can't answer specific questions on your own personal financial circumstances. However, we will do our best to point you in the right direction if you require some more information and uh, send you some more resources after the uh, session if um, that is appropriate uh, or if you would like some more information. So thanks everyone. Um, so I think I'm going to hand over first to Rebecca because the last time we, we had her on, she gave such a brilliant overview of the situation as it is uh, and what essentially we're all working towards in terms of trying to accelerate energy access and beyond that. So Rebecca, can, can I ask you to just give a flavour of um, why this is so important and and what you're seeing at the moment in terms of the um, demand for energy across um, sub-Saharan Africa. Absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, Lisa, uh, for having me and to the to the FX team. Um, and I'll just speak a little bit about what we're seeing right now across the, the, the Africa landscape. Um, and I think probably given the audience that you have on board, it's probably no news to them um, that that landscape is indeed in a lot of flux right now um, in, in Africa. Um, we have a lot of major challenges that are being addressed right now at the level of large scale energy infrastructure um, with regards to um, renewable energy uh, generation capacity, a lot of that coming online now. We're seeing a lot more attention to um, transmission and addressing the need for adequate transmission um, and transmission infrastructure upgrades. Connexa working in um, Nigeria. We just had a call last week with the um, with the ERD group here in, in Kenya looking at uh, power pools and the advances that are being made now to kind of revamp um, a lot of the power pooling activity. So at that, at that large scale, there's a lot happening. 
Um, and then, of course, um, even with all of that, there's still this 35% of the population only that has access, meaning that there's still 65% of the population across the continent um, without access to electricity. And there's a lot of work happening right now in this, in this space of trying to encourage um, and create more rural access to electricity. Um, so we're seeing um, a, a sort of a, a wave of decentralized renewable energy technologies also coming onto the scene that are at the center of this energy transition. Um, East Africa alone uh, uh, has announced more than two gigawatts or 2,000 megawatts of new solar and PV um, wind projects to come online um, within the next three years alone. Um, more than 40% of sub-Saharan African countries now have official what we call rural electrification targets. At least a third of those have specific decentralized renewable energy targets or plans in, in, incorporated. Um, and so we're seeing sort of this shift in terms of um, addressing uh, a policy shift or an enabling environment shift. Um, in terms of just to give you some hard numbers, um, Gogla, I, um, I'm sure these numbers are probably not out, out of date, but uh, within the first half of last year, so the, from January to June of 2019, there were over 4 million qualified, quality certified solar lanterns, multi-light systems, solar home systems, uh, sold just within that period on the continent. And of course, I think as we all know, there's a lot of development happening right now in the mini grid space. So AMDA's just put out a recent report on this and uh, SMAP estimates that there's roughly 4,000 mini grids in various stages of development or pipeline across the continent. So all of that to say, Lisa, that there's a lot happening both at the large scale, um, uh, at the utility scale rather, and in the decentralized space. Although there's many challenges to be met, we are seeing some action. Great. Um, and perhaps I could turn to uh, Chris, you next. So thinking, so that sets the context, which is, which is brilliant, and, and we can see what the challenge is. So tell me about the um, pay-as-you-go solar model and why that's particularly important uh, and how your organization is using that to help um, scale up across Africa. Yep, sure. So thanks, Lisa, and thanks for having me uh, on the webinar today. Um, so just a quick bit about Bbox, which will set the scene to, to answer that question. Um, Bbox pr primarily provides and distributes solar home systems uh, to our off-grid customers across a number of countries in both East and West Africa. And um, we do that on the, the pay-as-you-go method that we, you mentioned uh, just then, and that allows customers to get access to basic anything from basic lighting and phone charging all the way up to accessing larger household appliances like fans or TVs um, from on average on our side around $10 a month is the average payment that a customer makes to us and that can range from anything from a $5 payment for a very basic system up to uh, around the $20, $25 mark for, for a more advanced TV system. Uh, and this allows customers uh, to get access to those basic services um, on, on a pay-as-you-go method. And, and that pay-as-you-go method is extremely important because it allows customers to, to only pay for the time which they require and to pay in small installments. Uh, our minimum installments is just one day of, of energy. It's around 12 to 15 cents is the lowest payment that you can make. And that allows them when they have uh, access to, when they have um, uh, household spending available, they can then get access uh, to energy. Um, for Bbox, one of the key things is, is not just uh, access to solar home systems and energy, but we see energy being the sort of starting point for many future services that our customers need. Um, so for example, access to, to water or access to clean cooking. Uh, these are some of the things that we are also working on as a business um, in a number of our, our countries globally uh, to help uh, get access to a wider range of, of more productive services. So, and again, using that pay-as-you-go approach for some of those services also allows customers to develop and build their household or their businesses and the income streams that come with that. Um, so yeah, really important to in improve and increase the range of customers that we can reach uh, using the pay-as-you-go method. Um, so far today, Bbox has, has reached about um, 1.5 million people over the last 10 years that we've been running. Uh, we have around uh, 4,000 um, staff working for us in a number of different countries now uh, and in 12 countries globally. Uh, and, um, and yeah, hoping that that will grow and as many more people to electrify over the coming years. So hoping that those numbers will continue to grow. Thanks, Chris. Um, and, and coming to you, Sneha, why is on the other, the other side of the coin, why is, um, affordable finance and flexible finance so important to help you scale the business? 
Yeah, sure. Um, uh, so uh, for us, um, we're actually very similar to, to B-Box, uh, like them, we're uh, uh, pioneers in this uh, industry. Um, Azuri is actually headquartered out of uh, Cambridge um, in the UK, so we're offshoot of the university. Um, so that's where do, we do the product mm -hmm. innovation. Um, and I run um, uh, the Africa operations uh, out of here in, uh, in, in Nairobi. Uh, now, to make the, the Paygo operations work, uh, we basically need uh, three elements. Uh, one is, of course, uh, uh, a reliable and, and good quality uh, product uh, with the lockout uh, technology such that uh, if a customer uh, doesn't pay, then uh, the, the asset uh, uh, acts as a, as, as a collateral. Uh, second is we need to reach uh, the, the masses. Um, so basically distribution is uh, very key uh, and that's one area where Azuri differentiates uh, because um, we don't reinvent the wheel. Uh, we work with uh, local established players who have the, the infrastructure and the know-how um, that we, we ride on. Um, uh, now for us to be able to scale up very fast and uh, you know, we're, we're making a, a big uh, inroads uh, in that uh, as an industry, uh, the financing piece is extremely uh, important. And this is one area where um, we also uh, uh, have innovated a lot. Um, and uh, what we have put in place uh, is um, off-balance sheet uh, financing facilities. So, so typically in the early days when um, uh, companies were growing, uh, this sector, they had raised um, uh, lots and lots of uh, equity on their balance sheet and they were using uh, that equity uh, to basically on-lend uh, to, to customers. But of course, uh, uh, that gets quite, uh, quite limited if you want to um, uh, scale up fast. So what we've done is we've sort of ring-fenced the, the financing element um, uh, from our balance sheet and uh, we worked uh, very hard to develop uh, the track record and, and the portfolios where um, financiers can come in and, and effectively finance um, uh, good quality portfolios uh, with good track record of uh, um, the, the receivables or, or, or having um, good utilization and, and the uh, cash collections. Um, and again, there we uh, worked with uh, many um, development finance institutions. So uh, people like Electrify who are um, uh, partly funded by the European Commission and also um, uh, entities like uh, the DFID who have given us some uh, sort of subsidized uh, debt um, and then on the back of that, uh, we put in a little bit of um, equity uh, into sort of this, this uh, SPV structure uh, to cover our first loss. And on, on back of that, um, we raise uh, commercial debt um, uh, from uh, traditional lenders, but also um, with, with uh, entities like, um, like Energize Africa as well through uh, crowdsourcing. So uh, having innovated in these kind of uh, structures, um, that enables us um, to basically scale up very fast. Thank you. And we're talking there about innovation on the financing end. Uh, what's the innovation uh, on the customer end in terms of there's a question about how do the customers pay such small amounts? How is that done? Is it done through mobile technology or can you just give us a bit of information there? Yeah, so, I, um, so basically, um, as uh, many of the listeners would know, uh, Kenya uh, has been the, the hub of um, innovating in uh, mobile money. So M-Pesa uh, was started here. It's uh, been a big success. And uh, from that, it's uh, been rolled out um, uh, to the rest of uh, the, the African and uh, other uh, emerging markets. So, so that is a, a key piece uh, that, that, uh, of technology that we use. So for example, in Kenya, more than 50% of our GDP is transacted via mobile money. And it's quite ironic that, uh, you know, in not only in Kenya, but rest of Africa, there is much larger penetration of uh, mobile phones and, and having access to mobile money compared to uh, having access to, to power or, or electricity from, from their homes. And that is what, uh, what we solve. And of course, uh, we use uh, mobile money to, to be able to do that. Thank you. And Chris, you're nodding. Uh, in fact, yeah, just, just, just to reiterate, reiterate that, it's uh, mobile money is an extremely important enabler for our sector as a whole uh, to improve people's ability to pay in those such small installments. Having to pay, as I said, 15 cents uh, using cash or through to an agent would be quite tricky to handle logistically. Uh, we take over a million payments a month on our, uh, from our end customers. So having to deal with that level of transaction would be very challenging if there wasn't a platform like mobile money um, in place. And as, as Shniha said, Kenya has, has led the way in that, but it has now over the last few years started to, to expand its reach and, and more countries across Africa are starting to adopt and increase penetration levels of mobile money. So it's an extremely important thing when we assess a new market is, is the penetration of mobile money 
in those in those markets. Great, thank you. And we, we've obviously just been talking about um, predominantly um, domestic solar, where families are getting access to um, clean energy, which is used for um, lighting. It might be for charging a battery, for mobile phone charging. Um, it might be having, uh, you know, security lights on the houses or, or enabling children to do their homework in the evening. There's, there's a lot of uh, obviously different uses um, for the electricity. And, and that sort of speaks to some of the benefits that you see from um, enabling the energy access. But then there is also a lot more that can be done from the productive use side of things and enabling people to um, build their own businesses. And I wondered, Rebecca, if you could um, uh, just tell us a little bit more uh, about where you're seeing solar innovation in um, agriculture and health, for, for example. That was to yeah. you, Rebecca. Yeah. Um, yes, sorry, I was just looking for my mute button, absolutely. Um, so one of the, um, the, the opportunities that we're seeing, and I think as Nihar or Chris had alluded to it um, before, was basically the fact that um, we are seeing, of course, this new penetration of off-grid technologies that are helping to create access, but access for what, for what end, for what, for what purpose. Um, one of the areas that we're seeing a lot of activity is in this nexus with, with agriculture. Um, and, and that's uh, important because, of course, agriculture is, you know, one of the largest, if it is the largest economic um, sector across the continent, um, uh, contributing to over 65% of the workforce. Uh, and we're also seeing, and, and, and to GDP as well, um, and we're seeing, um, especially now with climate change, that's becoming a, a more challenging space to, to grow as well as now that a lot of that is compounded by COVID challenges. So we've seen a lot of disruptions to value chains and so on with COVID. Um, so there's a lot of attention on the agriculture space as a potential opportunity for livelihood creation, for economic activity, for food security, but also an acknowledgement of the, the ever-increasing challenges of, of growing this space. Just to give you one quick anecdote, um, right now across the continent, although um, it is the largest uh, um, economic sector across the continent, agriculture is accounting for just 2% of total electricity consumption, um, which sort of shows, you know, one of the challenges, which is that um, there is, there's, there's, an, there's, an, there's a barrier to productive productivity within the agriculture sector. Um, in fact, the FAO says that one of the reasons that the agriculture sector is is challenged to absorb more and more of a workforce here in Sub-Saharan Africa is because there is uh, more of a focus on area expansion rather than intensification of, of productivity. So what that means, just to break that down, is that there's really a lot of space um, within both increasing productivity at the farm level, so increasing uh, lots of technologies that can increase yield, um, increase yields like uh, solar irrigation and so on, as well as a lot of space in the value addition um, sector in terms of you know, post-harvest processing, um, pressing, milling, grinding, uh, storage, uh, that kind of thing. And both of those are really um, spaces I think that we're starting to see a lot and lot more of, of activity in. Um, according to IFC, there's well over 100 companies that are working within these spaces. Um, and again, just to give some examples, we're, talk, we're seeing companies in uh, cold storage, cold transportation, um, ice making, honey processing, oil pressing, maize milling, um, all of these are sort of areas where we're seeing small and medium sized enterprises um, looking to combine, uh, you know, mobile, uh, agile energy services, largely um, off grid renewables with this agriculture need. Um, and uh, just one other quick stat is that um, the IFC projects that um, there's actually about $11 billion worth of market potential just in this off grid um, off-grid energy for agriculture um, space. Um, and that's a, uh, that's a large market, of course, but one of the major challenges here, which I'm sure that Chris and Sneha will agree um, to, is affordability and the challenge of affording um, uh, and being able to make payments for these types of technologies. Of course, most of the farming community here in Sub-Saharan Africa is small-scale farmers. In fact, they're responsible for more than 85% of all crop production across the entire continent. And so that's the sector that really needs support, uh, that really needs to be um, 
um, enabled to, to afford um, these types of technologies. And in fact, when you think about that ability to pay, that reduces that available market or that addressable market down to something on the order of 200 million. So there's a, there's a serviceable market and then there's an addressable market. And the gap between those two is really um, a factor of affordability and other, and other such issues. So, uh, well, that leads in quite nicely um, because, you know, affordability also relates to um, cost of financing and, you know, there's a question as to what can individuals do, I'm coming to you, Julian, to, to look at the other side of the equation um, and to what extent are individuals wanting to put their money into these types of areas where they can actually really achieve quite, um, quite incredible impact as we're hearing. And, and I think that, that points, you know, the, the, the key to, to the issue, the, the impact, which is, is where there's definitely been a sort of pent up demand in, in, in terms of um, retail investors in, you know, in the UK. Uh, I mean, historically, you know, I, I'm a specialist in ethical and sustainable investment. I've been doing it for over 20 years, but historically the market's been very, very much centered around secondary markets, traditional investment in, in, in stocks and shares, uh, perhaps a little bit in, uh, in, in some ethically led banks and, well, banks really, uh, but, but a bit of a limited range. And uh, it's kind of, and that's good, and that has lots of positives in, 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 terms, of, uh, in terms of various aspects of the sector of, the, of, the, of global issues. But... Um, there's always been a desire to have some greater connectivity to to the outcome of the investment and uh, you know with the with the development of, of platforms you know like 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 uh, fx lisa that um it's created that marketplace where people can start to find investments which uh, which they can have a, a direct connection to seeing a real outcome because in the last what, five years since the um un sustainable development goals uh, were launched We've seen an increasing desire of people to to, to latch themselves onto that and to uh, and to identify something, but in many cases, there's not been a, a very linear link. Whereas with investments in Energize Africa, then you can it's, it's very transparent, really. You you can see where your money's going to, and you can you can you can perceive a, 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 a real bent as we're hearing from from the other panelists. Uh, you know the, the, the real impact on the ground that that makes. Uh, a real difference. I think that's the thing. It's um, it's additionality. The um, the UN Sustainable Development Goals were about bringing in new money, uh, the finance community bringing in new money to help solve, solve global problems, and, uh, and and that's really what uh, these investments are helping to achieve. And I guess you know, Sneha described the the um, menu of different finance options that they use and tools to um, to help uh, support the growth of, of your organizations. How do we, um, so back to the businesses, how do we, what does this market need to do in terms of retail investment? What do we need to do in terms of scale to get it to a point where it's an even bigger part of the portfolio uh, of finance options that you have because presumably it's it's a you know relatively small percentage at the moment but it feels as if you know there's there's growing demand but how much bigger does it need to be to to be a, a major component and solution to you um maybe chris first yeah, sure. So um, I think it already is becoming a substantial part of, of our business uh, along, alongside other um, local debt providers that are starting to, to get into this, this market. Um, we have seen it improve in recent years. It still has a long way to, to go. Um, but I, I think, um, you know, from our perspective, you know, just to put some numbers uh, together, um, we install about 15,000 systems every month. And, and in order to do that, uh, we need close to, to $2 million dollars of, of, um, of, of capital available every month in order to, to distribute that. It takes us on average around 18 months to 20 months to return that back to, uh, back to the company based on the payments that our customers are making. Um, so certainly there is there's a substantial working capital 
need for for our business um, and we are starting to see some more engagement from from local debt providers and from uh, platforms uh, such as Ethex and, and others uh, that uh, that help uh, address that gap but but certainly there are there is more that can be done but it's certainly improved a lot in the last five years uh, five years ago as I think Shniha said uh, most companies were raising equity and uh, and you know not able to get access to uh, to debt in, in its various forms and then certainly this this has helped uh, platforms like this have helped uh, improve that access. Anything to add Sneha? Um, yeah, I mean, um, so just um, uh, referring to some of the numbers that uh, Rebecca was uh, mentioned in terms of, uh, uh, you know, sort of gigawatts of energy that um, have been uh, made available in this part of the world. Um, we don't look at things uh, like that from a, a paper perspective. What we look at is, uh, you know, number of uh, lives or number of households uh, impacted. Um, and, uh, you know, energy, of course, is an, is an enabler. Uh, I saw there's a question about, uh, you know, the, the, the use of uh, TV, for example. Uh, so, you know, in terms of also how much retail investors are, are contributing, I think the way they should look at it is, you know, how many uh, households or how many lives um, they are impacting. Um, and, and, of course, at, at a bare minimum, they can be impacted by providing, you know, one, one house, um, with a lighting system, which costs, uh, you know, say something like 150 pounds or something like that. Uh, but what we are also seeing uh, as an industry is um, the consumers or the households are moving up uh, the energy ladder. So they're also very uh, aspirational. So, uh, you know, they're also uh, using this energy to basically power up um, other useful appliances and uh, televisions are, for example, uh, a key medium. Uh, and to give an example, um, yes, initially they were used for uh, entertainment, uh, but uh, like when we provide the television, we don't only supply the, the hardware, uh, but we, we supply it um, with the uh, access to, to that uh, content and the content as well, which is bundled in. So uh, all our televisions go with, uh, with satellite dish um, and the content uh, as well. So we're basically enabling the knowledge economy and, and through that, you know, uh, rural consumers have access to all the National Ge Geographic, the documentary, uh, you know, BBC channels. Um, and then more importantly, during the COVID period, we saw a big uh, uh, spike uh, in, in the television demand because the national curriculum of education uh, when schools were closed was being aired um, uh, via television. So, um, so yeah, I, I think uh, in order to basically uh, make more capital available, uh, it would be good uh, to, to basically open up the, the UK uh, investors uh, to, to the opportunity to uplift uh, lives um, and with power just being one part uh, of the story. Thank you. Uh, and we have a question um, regarding um, more of a urban um, setting for for solar with with the um, rapid urbanization uh, that you're seeing across many cities in in um, sub-saharan Africa well, all over Africa what to what extent um, is that an opportunity that you can service as well or is that does that require a different approach Chris yeah, sure. I, I can tell that one. So, so one of the best examples that we have uh, where we're tackling um, urban power challenges is in Goma in the east of the DRC. Um, and, and that's a particularly unique uh, situation. You know, there's, there's about a million, just over a million people in the city of Goma. Um, power cuts of, or power available of up to four hours a day. Uh, so 20 hours a day, you're, you're lacking access to power. So being able to run your business or your household with that variability of power is, is obviously quite difficult. And, and certainly even our solutions in these areas, um, although slightly larger and more aimed towards TV, fan and fridge uh, type customers, um, certainly have a role to play in, in, in the addressing these sort of challenges uh, alongside, of course, the national grid. Um, you know, and providing backup solutions to those those units. Um, so certainly there is um, possibility and absolute potential for uh, these types of systems to be used in an urban environment, although primarily most of our customer base today remains in rural off-grid areas uh, where the grid is, is uh, doesn't make economic sense for, for them to extend the grid into those areas. But uh, yeah, that, that's uh, from our perspective, it's a key growth area and we do see that um, the close to a billion people who have unreliable access and not just any access but unreliable access to, to power is, is a key growth area for, for our business as well. Okay uh, and there was a question regarding um, 
to what extent is um, lack of regulatory frameworks a deterrent for developing um, mini grids, for example, to increase energy access? Um, uh, Sneha, is that something or Rebecca to, to comment on? Maybe I can make a general comment on regulation um, and then maybe Rebecca if you have any specifics on the mini grid side, but um, uh, I mean we don't uh, focus on mini grids. We, we focus on off grid power on individual um, households. Uh, but I think one of the reasons why um, we've been successful in this part of the world is because of uh, I would say favorable uh, regulation. So as far as mobile money is concerned, the reason why mobile money had such a big uh, pickup was because of uh, flexible uh, regulation. Uh, and we're also seeing the same kind of support uh, from the government and the regulators in, in our sector as well. So I, I sit on the uh, Kenya Renewable Energy uh, Board as well. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, Kenya has been quite uh, um, uh, leading uh, in terms of making the off-grid uh, power uh, as part of their uh, 2023 universal access uh, electri electrification strategy. So, yeah, there is a lot of um, um, regulation here, a lot of bureaucracy is removed. So when it comes to, for example, um, uh, importing our units and clearing, that's, uh, you know, very efficient. Uh, in the short term, um, unfortunately, we're, we're facing um, with um, uh, taxation increases for the, the solar systems where initially we had uh, very good uh, taxation uh, benefits, but because um, the economies are, are struggling to raise their revenues, uh, they've had to now uh, reverse um, uh, some of those uh, uh, incentives. So, so taxation is something that uh, still needs to be worked on, but otherwise I would say regulation is very favorable. And just to add to that, Lisa, I would say that um, the, the two last questions are actually kind of related. The, your, your previous question was about um, urban and peri-urban communities. And actually, um, there's a stat, um, I think this is from Gogler, that about 35% of solar home systems um, being sold today on the continent are actually in peri-urban communities. So, so one in every three almost. So that is definitely... Um, a major growth area, as Chris said, and in particular for like, um, you know, we're talking about sort of um, with energy access, the what next space, um, with regard to e-cooking or electric cooking, almost in that, that, that space is almost entirely in urban and peri-urban communities. So, so, so yes to that. And one of the challenges and reasons for that is because of reliability issues, which Chris spoke about. And the fact that even within urban communities, like here in Nairobi, um, reliability can still be such a challenge. Um, and right now we're doing a project in Uganda, um, working directly with the utility and with mini grid companies and solar home system companies to think about whether or not integrated approaches to electrification can help um, bring the, the, the cost down for the consumer, bring the total cost down on the supply side and therefore, and also improve reliability, both in rural community, but also in urban settings. Um, one of the challenges that we've come across is this issue of regulation. Um, there are some countries that are far more progressive um, and, and others that are sort of just as we mentioned before in terms of um, rural electrification targets and so on, just sort of getting up to speed. Um, some areas where regulation can present a challenge are, of course, one around um, tariff and rate-based calculations. And so, you know, what are the rates that mini grids are able to charge in, in what types of communities? Another big regulation issue um, that needs to be addressed is around uh, compensation. So with grid arrival, what are the options um, that a mini grid company has um, or, 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 or uh, any sort of third party service provider? Can I pick up my assets and go? Can my assets, can I be compensated for the assets that I've put down? Um, what does customer transfer look like? So that entire space still needs, I think, a lot more, um, more clarity. Um, there's also challenges around concessions and what areas of a particular country um, mini grid operators are even allowed uh, to operate in and what those national electrification plans um, look like. And then finally, of course, um, permitting. So what are the permits that are required? If you're, if you're a simple 100 um, uh, kilowatt or even a 40 kilowatt system, what type of, of, of permitting process do you have to go through to serve these, these um, small communities of 100 to 400 households? Um, the good thing is that there, as I mentioned, there's a lot of countries that are um, being very progressive here. Of course, Nigeria um, is often pointed to as that example, but I, I would say in Uganda as well, they're just now developing and passing their off-grid regulations, which do speak directly to issues of compensation um, and grid arrival. And, um, and they're also developing and publishing uh, a national electrification plan. Uh, Kenya just launched its, uh, its Energy Act. So there is a lot happening in the space to address some of those um, regulation challenges. Yeah. Perfect. Um, 
So I want to ask a question back to Julian, um, because there's been a few questions and perhaps I need to um, uh, answer a couple of these things before we move on to um, how the businesses decide to go into new markets and new countries. Um, so if Sneha and Chris can be thinking about that, but, uh, but on the, um, so there's a couple of comments about, I'm going to the Energize Africa platform and um, whenever there's a project or investment that comes out, I can't get to it quick enough because it sells out, um, which is a nice position to be in from, from our point of view to a certain extent. But um, yes, uh, that that is a bit of a challenge um, and um, because of COVID um, there has been a more cautious approach that um, I think everybody has taken uh, with regards to opening up new risk um, and, and exposing retail investors to that because there has been quite a lot of um, variants in the situation on the ground in different countries and you know pleased to say you know as Sneha mentioned that actually uh, in some instances there's there's been a, a, a bolstering of demand and you know seeing increases uh, in demand over the Covid period but but that there generally has been a um, a, a more cautious approach um, to, to increasing this exposure but we are clearly the businesses uh, need a lot of capital we heard from Chris saying you know um, x amount per month needed to, to meet the demands and um, we're very keen to get new products onto the platform um, both from our existing investees but also from new um, investees as well and we're going through a process of onboarding um, those organizations it always has to be in mind of the right risk reward profile that's appropriate to retail investors and that's something that we always have to reiterate um, because you know this this is a retail investment um, opportunity that we're offering and you know obviously we need to be very careful um, on to, to you Julian that there's point about the in innovative finance uh, ISA which is something specific to the UK yeah. um, and there's obviously quite a lot of money across the board in um, ISAs in general what do you think can be done to perhaps mobilize more of that money into uh, these types of innovative uh, investments yeah I mean I think the um I mean, the Chancellor a few years ago had a bit of a, a spree in creating new ISA types, and it's a, it's a bit confusing for people in, in many ways, but the one that, uh, uh, you know, which you're able to offer, um, I think is a, is, is a really interesting alternative, uh, which is the innovative ISA. Um, and I think the simple thing for people to understand is that the ISA isn't a product, it's an allowance. It's an allowance that, that in the UK, the government will allow you to invest in in a variety of different types of underlying investments and the benefit from the investment returns and capital gains if there are any uh, being tax free um so it's uh, it, it's not a a one decision you know at all you, know, you you can you can allocate which is quite a lot of money for a lot of people twenty thousand pounds a year but slice and dice that into into a variety of different elements so you can have traditionally people will quite often have cash ices that's where most of the money in, in the ISA world uh, sits. And you've got stocks and shares ISAs as well. Uh, and then there's other smaller ones around um, lifetime savings for, for, for people under 40, the, the, the lifetime ISA. Um, so I think the attraction is thinking about taking longer term views in terms of, in terms of the money that people have in cash, because cash has been the default. And obviously with interest rates being your average cash ISA is probably earning you about 0.5% if that at the present time. So the, the, the rates being offered by uh, Energize Africa obviously look very attractive. You've spoken to the issue around, um, and around risk and I think, you know, as the financial advisor hat on my head says, you know, I have to flag that you have to have appropriateness of, uh, of time, purpose and objective. So these are longer term investments. Um, but I, I think the attractive thing I, I think is, is that the, these, 
at the present time, projects are relatively short time scale. They're sort of five years or so, medium, medium duration, but there's a, there's a repayment cycle. So there's that recyclability within the portfolio. So once you've got that money into that, then it can recycle and, uh, and go through. Um, and you're a, you know, you're a victim of your own success in terms of, uh, you know, what you're offering here. Uh, collectively because uh, it's becoming a, a sort of trusted brand which people like and, and understand and they understand the model so um, uh, I think really the, the, the issue is, is 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 what you're doing is talk about the story talk about the impact and, and what it does and identifying that the risk reward is actually a fair and an and attractive one perhaps also arguably less volatile than than, than people who are probably sitting in stock markets uh, when they were sitting there in March and looking at their rates falling rapidly, you know, it's a different type of risk, um, but it's, uh, it's, there's perhaps a degree more predictability there. Um, so question to, to Chris, um, there was a question around um, to what extent, you know, what, what leads you into new countries? Is it, mm. You know, is it the uh, government that sets the right um, uh, conditions for you to to mobilise in that particular country, or do you see particular demand? And you know, so what's what's the decision making process? Yeah, so so I probably in terms of I group into four key areas that we we probably look at. So so number one is is some of those macro factors um, that are going on in that country. So in particular, energy access rates. Uh, so how many what's the percentage of households that still have or lack access to to electric power? That's obviously a key key area for us. Uh, if it's close to ninety percent, then it probably the addressable market is going to be very small for us um, household incomes is, is another key one you know, what are the household incomes of customers in the areas in which we want to distribute products into and what percentage of their household income would they need to spend in order to to get access to one of our services um, so it's probably on the macro side that's the first piece we look at and then next sort of level down is, is around mobile money as has already been mentioned uh, robust mobile money infrastructure is, is quite important and also good mobile network penetration rates in those in those countries so people can actually use the mobile services that's probably another important factor for us and government support as you mentioned also comes in a um, number of the countries that we're working in have government programs um, that have, have definitely improved in in the last few years um, one example we like to cite is is togo um, there in, in togo we've been distributing our products with about uh, 50,000 active customers in Togo since 2017 um, and there there's some very strong government support um, in a number of different areas to assist us with with uh, market entry and scale up um, so certainly government support is a key one I think the, the interesting one which I'd just like to mention is, is the final fourth piece is around access to talent and access to good human capital and I think that's one of the one of the difficult challenges of, of scaling in some of our markets is that in some of the areas we have to work in um, access to, to good talent we are competing with other key organizations, you know, banks and governments and other things in those areas. So access to, to good local uh, talent is also a key thing for us um, and to, to, in order to scale our, our presence in those countries. So those are the four things that I would, would summarize. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point. We, Energize Africa is part of the um, Transforming Energy Access Program, formerly of um, DFID, um, and and UK Aid is a huge supporter of um, Energize Africa right from the get-go. And, you know, there are certain elements within this Transforming Energy Access Programme and being able to develop talent in Africa um, to be able to grow the businesses um, is, is one of the strands of that. Um, so it's a really important point. Um, and there's an interesting question that's come in. Uh, and perhaps it sort of talks about which countries do you go in and, and who's active in where. Sneha, um, do, do the organisations work together um, un, under, the, so, you know, uh, within Energize Africa, we have Azuri and Bbox and Solatec and Sun Transfer and many more. To what extent is there um, collaboration or is it very much um, a, a, a sort of silo um, effect? 
Yeah, no, um, there, there is a fair bit of uh, collaboration. Of course, we are all uh, competitive uh, entities. Uh, but like, for example, uh, uh, two examples. One is through our sort of um, overriding body, which is uh, GOGLA, which is the Global Off-Grid Lighting Association. Um, so they bring um, uh, all, all the industry players together on, on many fronts um, uh, in terms of also enabling uh, access to, to finance, uh, but also they've put in place, for example, um, consumer protection principles. Uh, which, for example, Azuri um, has uh, has signed up to. So we want to also make sure that um, uh, we, are, we are being very, very transparent uh, to, to the consumer who may not be uh, uh, fully uh, literate. So we have to go the extra mile to make sure that you know, everything is laid out properly and they understand um, what kind of terms uh, they're, they're signing up to on a very sort of uh, fair uh, policy. And, and that's something that is monitored by by Gogla. Um, you know, our industry is quite uh, new and we're developing a lot of KPIs and, and metrics on performance. So there's, you know, a lot of uh, working groups uh, on that. Uh, and then, you know, in individual markets, uh, again, Kenya uh, leads on uh, many fronts, but we see uh, many other um, uh, uh, countries uh, across the continent sort of uh, benefiting from uh, uh, copy pasting effectively what we put in place here. So um, uh, I'm very active in the Kenya Renewable Energy Board and uh, um, we come together to tackle a lot of issues when it comes to say uh, lobbying the government on, on, uh, on tax incentives. Um, uh, we, we collaborate a lot. Uh, then the other very big area and important area that um, we are collaborating is on, on e-waste as well because you know we're all very responsible and want to be, um, you know, sustainable uh, companies. Um, so th there is uh, e-waste uh, regulation that has been uh, uh, put in place, um, and uh, you know we, we collaborate to, to get synergies to to see how you know rather than each entity to to, to invest a lot uh, in in the e-waste processes, you know, can we get synergies by by collaborating as well? So those are just some examples of uh, you know how we do work together to advance this industry. Yes, great. That, and that's really, really great to hear. Um, there's a question which, you know, cuts to the very core of what we're doing here, um, which Rebecca, I think would be great if you could answer, which is, um, are these sorts of investments just UK people profiting from um, people in Africa or are they genuinely beneficial to Africans? Um, perhaps it cuts back all the way to, you know, what the benefits are on the ground and, you know, and hopefully um, I should say that Energize Africa, as I said, was, was spun out of a um, competition actually that, that uh, DFID um, put out there to, to look at innovative finance um, mechanisms for providing uh, flexible finance uh, to accelerate energy access. So, uh, I hope just in the in the context of of that, it makes sense that we do what we do, and we do it very much with a um, equality hat on, and and hoping that the across the value chain there is uh, equal distribution um, in terms of um, what we do and the rewards uh, that come from that. But Rebecca, perhaps you could address the point regarding the benefits? Yeah, it's a very important question to ask and, and a very responsible question to ask. And I would say that um, for us, we're tracking um, the COVID relief funding that's coming into the sector here in Africa um, and seeing, you know, from debt to concessionary impact finance to grants, where is it all going? Um, and what we're seeing, and this is confirmed by reports um, recently released by Gogla, is that there is definitely quite a bit of an imbalance. Um, I think Gogla found that as much as 20 um, of, of, the, um, of all of the investments uh, uh, committed to the off-grid energy sector for 2020, more than 75% of it went to the top three international companies. Um, and those companies are doing great work, of course, but that means that there's also a slew of local companies that are sort of, um, you know, being left out of the picture. Um, and so I think that there's a lot that can, that can happen to help it ensure that there is more diversification and localization of the, of the funding streams. Um, just one is one that we've been talking about a lot, right, which is um, supporting these spaces that are um, in what we call nexus areas with, with energy access. So, um, you know, investors um, being able to support directing, um, 
investment to agriculture, um, SME um, development and enterprise, healthcare, those things trickle back to the energy sector over time and actually in the, in the very near term because once we have things like, you know, um, stronger subsidies or rebates for agro, agriculture equipment or, you know, more um, incentives for e-cooking and so on, all of that increases consumption, um, demand and therefore consumption, and that trickles back to the mini grid developer or, 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 the, or the, the CNI solar provider um, as revenue, um, which then allows them to recoup their investment um, more quickly. So, so one is sort of seeing a diversification um, outside of energy is actually beneficial for the energy sector. Um, number two is just, you know, being able to um, encourage, um, uh, you know, especially in impact invest investment spaces are able to um, direct through their incentives the way that we think about impact. Um, so that's what whatever is the, the characteristic, the, the, the KPIs and the indicators that are required of them. That's what the companies, of course, are going to um, devote their devote their M and E resource and time to. So if, for instance, jobs is, is an issue that we care about seeing impact. Um, locally, then we have to encourage that as an impact um, area of focus for companies. And, 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 under, and once that happens, we'll be able to understand those linkages even better. I can tell you as a researcher that we have very little information on those linkages. Um, we have a lot of anecdotal information, but encouraging companies to, to track those impact areas will encourage um, a more direct uh, sort of, you know, um, uh, um, one to one mapping of investments to impact. And then, thirdly, the topic that Chris brought up and that you touched on of, of workforce development is another major area um, where investment can be directed to make sure that that effect is, is, is being localized. We just did a research um, uh, exercise last year called Powering Jobs. It's actually an entire campaign, and we published the first ever bottom up study of, um, of uh, it's like a job census, both for, for decentralized renewable energy companies in Kenya as well as in Nigeria. And what we found is that the sector, although it's very nascent, is actually producing um, quite a number of job opportunities. In fact, in Kenya, as many as 10,000 direct jobs are being created just through direct employment with these companies. As a, and then when you add in the indirect employment and the productive use jobs that are stimulated through access, the, of course, the numbers scale. And that's as many as KPLC is employing today. Um, so it's it's quite there's there's definitely um, a, um, a workforce opportunity here, and I think it's less about developing talent locally, but more about accessing that talent. Exactly as Chris said, or I think it was Sina who said, you're competing with the banks, you're competing with the Googles, the Microsofts, everyone else that is here. And so you know, developing strong recruitment pipeline um, initiatives and investing in those pipeline initiatives is another way to ensure that we have a localized impact as well as supporting soft skills training, because what a lot of companies say is it's not so much about the technical skills that are, that are lacking or anything. It's really, you know, the soft skills, understanding of workforce spaces, of leadership strategy, finance, legal, um, et cetera. And so encouraging programs to support um, that kind of uh, curricula would, of course, help to ensure that benefits are, are localized. Okay, thank you. And, and I think, um perhaps also that question was was also to the sort of direct uh benefit and beneficiaries and and certainly on um energize africa we very much track in people's portfolios that the amount of money that is invested and what that relates into uh from a sort of personal impact statement point of view um so we are coming to the end of our um, webinar. I think we have answered a reasonable amount of the questions. Um, uh, and if we haven't, we can always direct those questions on um, to the right people after the webinar. Um, just to finish, someone's asked about blended finance approaches. And I think um, Energize Africa is probably a good example of um, blended finance because we, invest in uh alongside the crowd money some of uk aids um investment as well which in some cases is also used as first loss um but just as an example of how blending is being used uh and, and creating more leverage from from the crowd investment as well so um there's a definitive um cry from those people listening today that we need more product so uh, Chris and Sneha, I'll leave that in your um, ear. <laughs> um, so we'd very much like to have some more product from Missouri and Bbox soon. Um, and I think 
Julian, you you, you seem to um, you seem to imply that there's there's certainly a lot more demand and an interest from individuals uh, uh, getting involved in this area as long as the right um, risk reward balance is there. Um, and and so uh, yes, do you want to just just yeah, um, yeah sure, just 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 I mean. Mm. Yes, I mean, I think people are very concerned about, we did a survey recently, people are very concerned about climate change. This is, this is, a, this is a, a way to attract, to attract that in, a, in an aspect, but it's impact and connection. And there's accessibility and recyclability of the money, I think, which is, which is, which are some of the really interesting things, as well as the impact um, that, it, that it can carry on doing good because of the model that you've got in terms of the, uh, you know, the, the, the various projects which go on. Um, so yeah, definitely an ongoing demand, ever growing. Good. Um, any last thoughts from you, Chris, and then Sneha? Yeah, no, it's great to see so much engagement um, from from the UK retail investor space, and then to the, the the demand and the cry there for, for more products has certainly been been, um, been noted, and uh, it's great to see that there's there is that interest, um, and from our side as well, you know, we, we we are on an expansion path and growth path, both within the countries that we're already in. And, and also opening up into new countries. Um, and we hope that you know, we can continue to, to do that over the coming years so that we can offer more opportunities for, for the, the people listening to this, this webinar. Sneha. Yeah, um, so once again, uh, uh, thank you for uh, all the support from um, especially the, the UK uh, investors. Uh, you know, we, we're just at the tip of the ice, iceberg. Um, and the analogy we, we draw is, you know, how mobile phones leapfrogged uh, landlines uh, in emerging markets. Uh, that's the same revolution we expect to see to happen um, with, uh, with Paygo Solar, uh, that, you know, all these houses will probably never see a, a grid connection. Uh, ever and you know we're moving up uh, as I said earlier the energy ladder um, so you know as, as we do that come up with more exciting products uh, you know those uh, will require uh, more fun funding and you know that funding remember it goes directly to the uh, to, to, to the end uh, customer um, so yeah we, we look forward to having um, uh, everyone on board uh, on this journey thank you and thanks Rebecca to you again um, for being such an active member of the panel and it's great to hear everyone's perspectives um thank you very much for taking part again really appreciate it and i uh, hope everybody enjoyed it who's listening in um thanks for joining and um speak to you all again soon thank you thank you thanks everyone bye bye